I am so glad to be here on Father's Day. It's a good day. It's a great day uh, to be in the house of the Lord as we celebrate dads. We have the best father in the world, uh, and we, I'm glad that you are here with me this morning. So if you have your Bibles, uh, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 15. Uh, we're going to be there this morning. But before we get into that, I want to kind of drop some knowledge for some of you wives and children and future wives that are sitting here this morning. Um, like, I kind of feel like at times my job, it's, it's kind of, I'm a full service pastor, right? And so I want to be able to help you guys understand your husbands a little bit better this morning. Or if you're not married one day, you know, if you, when you get married, you'll be able to understand him. And as a result, your marriage and your relationship will be that much stronger. So I'm going to just I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be an interpreter for the men of the world this morning. First one is this. When a man says it would take too long to explain, what he means is, I have no idea how it works. Baby, it's just going to, listen, I could tell you, but it's just going to be forever. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't know. When a man says, take a break, honey, you are working too hard. This is what he means. I can't hear the TV over the vacuum. Please stop working. When a man says, this is tricky. When a man says, that's interesting, dear. What he means is, are you still talking? I'm just the messenger. When a man says, it's a guy thing. What he means is, there is no rational thought pattern connected with this, and you have no chance of making it at all logical. When a man says, can I help with dinner? If your man ever says that, your husband ever says, can I help with dinner? This is what he means. Why isn't dinner ready yet? When a man says, uh-huh, sure, honey, or yes, dear, it means absolutely nothing. It's just a conditioned response from over the years. When a man says, I can't find it, what he means is, I can't see it from where I'm standing, so it must be gone forever. When a man says, I heard you, right? This is what he means. I haven't the foggiest clue of what you're talking about. I'm hoping that I can desperately fake the rest of this conversation so it'll be over. When he says, you look terrific. He means this. Oh, please, God, don't try on another outfit. <laughs> listen, I'm just... Listen, there's 50% of this church is women, so I've got to appeal to both sides. When a man says, I don't remember saying that, he means... Anything I said six months ago can't be counted in any conversations going forward. And anything I say after seven days becomes null and void. When a man says, this is important, that's not what I meant. He means, if something I said can be interpreted two ways, and one of those ways makes you sad or angry, I meant the other one. So, Understand now, as you go home, you'll be able to understand your husband a little bit better. Guys, we're going to have to, listen, they're starting to figure, and I kind of gave it away, some of these things. So we need to always be evolving and improvising new ways to get through conversations or get through whatever we need to get through, okay? Most people, getting back into Luke chapter 15, most people, even if you have never been in church, in your life. Today, today, this morning is your first time ever in church. You've never really read the Bible, um, but if you, you have almost zero Bible knowledge, you have probably at least somewhat familiar with the story of the prodigal son, and this is where we've been the last two weeks, and this morning we are finishing up this series. Mark, Mark Twain once said, once was asked, who is the greatest storyteller of all time? And his answer was, Jesus. And they followed up. It's like, well, what was his greatest story? And he said, the prodigal son. This story is simply incredible. It's 21 verses that just it shows us our own hearts, but more importantly, it shows us the heart of our heavenly father. And the prodigal son is one of those stories. It's one of those passages in the Bible that we're so familiar with. If you grew up in church, you've been hearing this story since you were a little bitty kid. 
And so it's one of those that we can just kind of, as we get to that part in our reading in our Bible, we can kind of rush through it. and we'll, Oh, well, I know the story. And it, that's not a good way to read the Bible. Is, and so sometimes it's a good thing to slow down and really just start um, dissecting how it goes. The prodigal son had told his dad, he said, Dad, I wish you were dead, basically is what he told him. He said, I want my money, and I want it now. Right? He called J.G. Wentworth. He wants his money, and he wants it now. And, he's, and that was the level of disrespect that that would have shown to his father. It, we don't understand it in today's culture. And so he had told his dad, Dad, I wish you were dead. Um, I, my life would be better without you. And so this dad shockingly gives his son his inheritance early. And this son goes out and he blows it in no time. He tries to fix it. Then he tries to fix it himself, right? He, he blows all of his money. He has nothing. He's like, well, I'll, I'll just go to work. I'll find a job. I'll make better choices. And then my life will be better. But that's not how it works because our best will never be good enough without the heavenly father. And so we can't fix life ourselves. And then last week we talked about really the star of the story, right? Most people tend to think that the youngest son is the star, right? Like that's who we tend to focus on. But the reality is, is Jesus told this story in response to some Pharisees and scribes who were grumbling and whining and complaining that Jesus was hanging out with sinners and tax collectors. And so Jesus, he, he, in Luke 15, he tells us three parables and he finishes with this one. And it really highlights and shows the legalistic, self-entitled, privileged and proud hearts of the Pharisees and the scribes. Both of the sons, the younger son and the oldest son, both of them abused their father great, their father's grace. But neither son had a relationship with the dad. The oldest son, he didn't leave. He was just less obvious in his um, how much he did not like his father. So this morning, though, as we are, you know, as father on Father's Day, I want to take a look at the dad. So Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 17. When he finally came to his senses, talking about the youngest son, when he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But the father said to the servants, Quick! Bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast for the son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. This is such an incredible story. The people listening to Jesus tell this would have had their minds blown at every turn. Once again, remember, the Bible is an ancient Middle Eastern book. And in that culture, the people who were listening to this story, every time Jesus finished the sentence, they would have been just like, oh my goodness, can you believe that? And every and it just kept on going for 21 verses. As far as they were concerned, the youngest son was as good as dead for the way that he treated his father. So for, this, for his dad to embrace his son the way that he did is absolutely mind-blowing to them. And as we've already discussed, the dad in the story, it represents our heavenly father. So the character traits that this, this dad portrays that he has is actually the character traits of our heavenly father. So this morning, I want to look at three of those traits that made this dad so special. Number one, the dad was a protector. The text says that when he saw his son from a long way off, he ran to meet him. Understand this. Rich, old, Jewish dudes didn't run. Ever. It was a complete disgrace for them to run. And here's the reason why. is because they wore tunics, these long flowing dresses, okay? And so it was down below their feet. And so for them to run, 
they couldn't run with the tunic on, so they would have to hike up their tunic and start to run, which would, in fact, which would then show their legs to everybody around them. And that was a disgrace. That was shameful act for men back then. I'm going to be honest. kind of wish some of that shame would come back for some of those short shorts you guys have been wearing. And yes, I'm talking to Scott. In the 90s, early 2000s, we fought hard to get longer shorts. And in one generation, you guys messed it up, and now you get those five-inch shorts. Like, come on. There needs to be some shame in showing that much leg. And so that is what the father, by running, he is disgracing himself. The Greek word for ran in this text is the same word to describe racing in a stadium. So this is a full-on sprint that the father does. He is Usain Bolt at the Olympics running the 100-meter dash. He is all out as fast as he can go running. And the people of that village would have looked at him and saw how he reacted. Man, you know what? I thought he was better than that. I've lost a little bit of respect for it. Did you see? Like, not only is he welcoming his son back, but did you see him hike up his tunic, show off his legs to everybody, and start running? Like, I thought he was better than that because they were upset with him because he was not acting the way that he should be acting in their view but he didn't care and we can relate to that because how often and you don't have to answer this one out loud but how often do we get upset with our heavenly father because he doesn't act the way that we think he should act like oh geez how could you how could you do that you should you should know better than that god i can't disappointed, I thought, you could be, I thought you'd be better than this. I don't understand why you're, that's how they're acting is they don't understand. Like they get mad at the father because like, why are you acting that way? You're better than this. You should, do, you should know better than this. But why would he run into the town square to greet his son? It's not only because he was excited to see his boy. He was protecting him from anyone inside of that town who would have tried to shame him from his past mistakes. This is a small town they're living in. Do we know a thing or two about small town living and how quickly the gossip train runs in this town? Like, listen, listen, it's going to hurt a little bit. Even inside this church, all right, I'm going to give you an example of this. A few weeks ago, and this is extra. I wasn't on my notes. I just thought of it. A few weeks ago, I drove my father-in-law's um, Infinity SUV, nice SUV, way out of my price range. But he had my truck or my vehicle, whatever, and I drove his because I was bringing stuff to the church and parked to my spot. Fifteen minutes after I got here, people were like, oh, I heard you got a new car. I heard you got a new car. It's like it was like we're paying you too much, evidently. Like this is why I drive junk. Because I want those small towns operate different. Like we, everybody knows everybody's business. When Katie and I were dating, the first time I went to St. John, that's our little bitty town of like 700 people in the middle of nowhere, Kansas, all right? First time I go, I picked her up. She was nannying for some people in, in Wichita, and I picked her up in Wichita, and we drove home. I was going to meet her dad, right, and her stepmom and her mom and her sisters and everything. And so she's like, oh, let's drive around the town. I'm going to show you my hometown, right? And after like 12 seconds, we were done because that's how small it was. It made Windsor seem like Kansas City. But here I am, I'm driving red Mustang, right? Everybody there drove trucks, so and it's bright red, right? It's got gangster tanned windows, right? You can't see who's in it. And this is the thing that I found out about Kansas, is they don't believe in four-way stops, right? Like, it's weird. This is not just her, it's everywhere. And so we go around the square, and I stop, and I'm like, this is a four-way stop because I'm normal. But not in Kansas. That's not how they do it. So I, I stop, and then I pull out, and there's a car coming. I made the assumption. I get it. I was wrong. I made the assumption that he was stopping too. He did not have a stop sign. Turns out it's the cop, the cop of that St. John, right? The, the, not one of the cop, the cop. He pulls me over, and it's just like car, out of state plates. It's out of place. Who is this person trying to think? Like, and as I'm sitting there, Cars start driving by. Multiple cars, the same cars over and over again, trying to figure, 
15 seconds after I get pulled over in the square of this town, the entire town knows that there's a new person in town with a sports car, and he's on the square, and they're all driving by to see what's going on. Her dad knew I got pulled over before I even got there. Luckily, she went to high school with him and got me out of the ticket, so it was all right. But that's the way that small towns operate is everybody knows everybody's business. So everybody in this home t- in this small town knew the son's business. They knew how shamefully he had acted. They knew that he had squandered everything. They knew everything about him. And they would have, as they saw him walking into the town square, they would have done everything they could to ridicule and taunt him and shame him. But the father runs from his house to get to his son before they have an opportunity to do that. Dads, we have the best jobs in the world. I love being a dad. There is nothing better than coming home and your kids running up to you yelling, Daddy. They can't run up and give you hugs and and just start going a million miles an hour. And when the kids were little, when they used to take naps, if I was home when they got up from their naps, I'm like, I got this. Because I wanted to be going to their rooms, pick them up and save them from the cribs. Their mean old mommy had put them, made them take a nap, and here comes Daddy to the rescue. I loved being their rescuer. It's imprinted in our DNA as men to be protectors. And this dad, he places himself between the crowd and his son so that all the verbal barbs that the son would have received are now being redirected to the father. Because now they're focused on how shamefully the father acted. And so all the focus, all the attention is on him and not his son. He is a protector. Instead of trashing his, their son, his son for their shameful behavior, All the attention turns to dad, our heavenly father. He takes all, when Jesus died on the cross, he took all of our shame, all of our past mistakes, and he took it upon himself to save us from having to live in shame. I was listening to this uh, video clip a week or two ago, and it was this, um, it was an interview, it was a highlight clip of a a guy who had been uh, arrested and sentenced and, and found guilty of child, like he was abusing children sexually, right? And, and they were asking him, how did you pick your targets? And he said something really interesting because you would think the answer would be, well, I just found the kid who was off by himself and walked home by himself and they were easy slim, you know, easy pickings. That's how I found it. He's like, no, no, before every, every victim I ever had before, I didn't look at them individually. I looked at the family. And if the father was active and around and, and I perceived him as a threat, I moved on to my next victim. Dads, we got to be present. We got to be, be a little bit dangerous in the eyes of the people who are wanting to hurt our children because we know that we are willing to protect and fight for them no matter what. But keep in mind, also, this is also a side note for free, people in our government, people who are leading this nation, they call men who are a little bit dangerous Men who act like men, men who protect their families, they call it toxic masculinity. They're trying to, re- the same people who are trying to remove the, uh, the father out of the situation, out of the family, and like, you're toxic, you're bad, are the same ones who are wanting to teach kindergartners about sex. Think about it. The world hates you, hates your kids, and wants to, and it's up to us as men. Moms, you play a role in this too. I'm not discounting, but it's Father's Day. Men, we have to be protectors of our children. The second trait of, the, of this father was that he was generous. Think about all of the events that have happened in a few short verses. This boy has disgraced himself and disgraced his family. He was lost and in most people's view, completely unredeemable, but not to the dad. The youngest son blows his money wrecks his car, does everything he could to shame the father and is left with nothing but thinks to himself, hey, my dad has hired servants and according to him, have food to spare. Those four verses inside that passage, mark them, circle them, they're important. They had, those four words carry so much weight. And what he means by this is this, hired servants at this point in history are people who the father would have hired on a daily basis. He would have gone out every morning and hired them. These people, they weren't servants of the family. They weren't slaves of the family. They weren't family members. They were day-to-day day laborers. They were people who were desperate for jobs because back then, if you didn't work, you didn't eat. Messed that one up, haven't we? Right? But back then, if you didn't work, you didn't. So these people are desperate for anything. 
And the father would go and hire them on that daily basis. And, and at the end of the day, he would pay each one of them according to the Levitical law in Leviticus chapter 19. I know it's a boring book, so take my word for it, all right? In Leviticus 19, it talks about paying day workers daily. So at the end of the day, you would, as before, as you the work day was over, the father would pay them. And on their way home, these men, these workers would stop at the store, would stop wherever, and buy food for his, their families. Once again, they're desperate. They're poor. They have nothing. And the father, knowing that, still gives them so much food, still pays so much extra that they have food to spare. The father is extremely generous in how he deals with people. That partial sentence is so full of incredible hope for all of us. Our Heavenly Father is so generous with His blessings that we have food to spare. There is no shortage to His blessings. We talked about this last week, right? Just because somebody else gets blessed doesn't mean that you no longer get blessed. Oh God, I, I was really hoping for a blessing, but instead you gave it to so-and-so. No, no, that's not how it works because our Father, our Heavenly Father has so many blessings that we have food to spare. The father, as soon as he sees his son, sprints out to protect him from the mob. Then he does the unthinkable and he forgives him on the spot, no questions asked. And if that wasn't enough, he could have stopped right there. And this son, he would have given his son a million more times than what he deserved. But the father doesn't stop there. He then throws a party in his son's honor and invites Everyone, every, the same people who think that his son should have been stoned, the same people who think that you're a disgrace for running and forgiving him, those same people who are gossiping and, well, oh, can you believe that he's acting that way? Can you believe his son had the nerve to come home? Those same people, the father says, hey, I'm throwing a party and I want all of you guys to come. This would have been the biggest party that town has ever seen. And he tells his servants to go quickly and get the best robe. The best robe was, was the, I mean, it was the best robe in the family. They didn't, even as rich people, they had like, this is our good robe, right? Like, it's like It used to be you go to your grandparents' house, it's the good china or whatever. This is the good robe. This was the robe the father would have been saving for his oldest son to use on the day that he got married because for that family, the best day that family ever had was when the oldest son would have gotten married because of what that would have meant culturally, right? Somebody to carry on the line of the family, somebody to provide grandchildren and those kind of things. And the dad says, yeah, we're saving it for the older brother's wedding, and it's still going to be there, but right now we're throwing a party. Bring the best robe and give it to my son. The, you know, bring, this, bring him sandals because only hired help who weren't a part of the family would have gone without shoes. And so the dad says, no, you're, you're my son. Put shoes on his feet. Put a ring on his finger. All of those things I would encourage you at some point to look up because each one of those things have meaning and it shows us something. So on your own time, look it up and, and research what all those things mean. He says, put a robe on him, the best robe. Put sandals on his feet. Put a ring on his finger. All of which represent the father fully restoring his son. Then he says, hey, go quickly and kill the fattened calf, right? Spare no expense. If it were me, and this was Maddox, and he had said, Dad, I wish you were dead. Give me my money. I'm leaving. I gave him $3, right? And that's all my money. But if he came back after all the mistakes that he had made, if it were me, I would probably think, you know what? All right, son, I forgive you. Why don't you go on the back 40 for a while? Let me just see if you're real serious about this repentance thing. I just want to make sure that you're not just here to, to scope us out and try to get back in good graces, but you really have nothing as judgment. If that were me, and if that were you, that's how a lot of us would have responded, right? Oh, son, I forgive you, but there would have been a little bit of a wall there still. I'm just going to make sure. I'm not the dad. He says, you're back. I forgive you. I love you. I'm restoring you to complete and total sonship. And as dads, we should be the example in our families of what generosity looks like. We should be the ones who are excited to bring the tithe check each week. It shouldn't just be mom's responsibility to do that. We should be the one who is teaching our kids about being generous with our time and our money and our resources and how those are good things. This family, they're rich, right? They're super rich. 
And the thought could be like, well, yeah, of course he's generous. He's got so much extra money. If I was rich, if I wasn't broke, then I would be generous. First of all, no, you wouldn't. If you're not generous with the little bit you have, you're not going to be generous if you get a lot. Let's just be honest. Okay? And second of like, and I always get so upset when people are like, well, he's rich. You know, Jeff Bezos or somebody like that will give $5 million to a charity. They're like, well, he's rich. Of course he could do that. That's like me giving 50 bucks. First of all, have you given 50? Oh, no? Okay, so he has given more than you, even by your own standards. And secondly, they're not, you know, rich people are not required to give anything. It's their money. They worked hard for it. They, they, were, they were smart enough to create a, an iPhone or whatever the case may be. And so they're not required to give anything. And trust me, I'm not defending Jeff Bezos because the only thing that we have in common, he has a lot of my money, right? Every day I get reminded of how much money he has in mine. But that's the thing is that, yes, the father was rich. Yes, he had a lot to give, but it still went above and beyond, and he was still generous with what he was giving. We have lost the joy of being generous. It's all become about me, 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 me. And thankfully, our Heavenly Father isn't about me, 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 me. He's about us, and he, wants, he is generous in what he gives, provides us, and he wants us in return to be generous with our families and our friends and the people that we come into contact with. And the final character trait I want to look at this morning is that the Father was full of grace. And listen, I know, we've said grace a lot the last three weeks. And I was even, when I was putting this together, I'm like, man, are we going to talk about grace again? Like, and it, and it is just, it hit me is, yes, we may be tired of hearing that word, right? Like we talked about grace last week and we're talking about this week. We talked about it two weeks ago, but here's the thing is that we should never get exhausted or grow weary of talking about the most beautiful and priceless thing that is available to us. And that is the grace that our heavenly father has given us. We talk about our kids all the time. We talk about, we don't get tired about talking about hunting or fishing or our cars. We can't get tired of, of celebrating and enjoying the grace that the Father gives us. The amount of disrespect the Son showed to His Father is beyond anything that we can really understand today. Because today, if you go to the grocery store this afternoon, if you go to Walmart, heaven forbid you go to Walmart, like this place is dark, right? But if you go in there, there's a good chance you're going to see a child back-talking their parents at the very minimum. Like, right, we've seen the ones that are cussing their mom or their grandma or whatever the case may be. So we see that. We've become kind of conditioned to seeing the disrespect from children to their parents. But back then, this is a whole different level of disrespect. And it's actually the father of Peter responded with, this is how you want to treat me? All right, guys, we're going to stone him and kill him. People would be like, yeah, that was justified. That's what he could have happened. His sin towards his father was so extreme in that time period, he deserved to spend his, the rest of his life eating pig, pig's food. But that's not how the father saw it. Here's the reality. As hard as it may be for you to accept this, is, listen, you may be a, a wonderful, incredible, awesome, best person in this room. Like You just do life. But even you, even the best person you've ever met, in the eyes of Jesus, if you're going to look at what we deserve and what we don't deserve, we all deserve to be eating pig's food. But the father says, no, no, no. Bring the robe. Bring the sandals. Put a ring on his finger. You are my child, and I don't care about your past. I don't care how you treated me in the past. I don't care about your past mistakes. You are my child, and I love you. Welcome back to the family. Because he is a God that is full of grace. And at times, as dads, we can be a little bit harsh or short with our kids. We demand perfection. When we demand that our kids fall in line with whatever we say, and we come down hard on them at times when they mess up. And sometimes that's what they need, is they need us to come down hard. But there are other times when they need us to be the dad who is sitting on the front porch, watching and waiting for their son to come home. And when we see them, we run to them. We run to forgive them and kiss them and restore them. Because that is how our heavenly Father responds to us. Because we are all at one point, or still currently, this prodigal son out living wildly. And there's Jesus on his front porch, just watching and waiting and praying and hoping that one day he's going to see you walking up into the village and he is going to run. He's going to hike up his tunic and he's going to sprint past everybody else to restore you and welcome you home. Because he is a God that is full 
of grace. Pastor Regina, will you come up? The listeners of this story saw the youngest son as unredeemable. He was beyond hope, beyond grace, beyond forgiveness. Remember, if the father would have followed typical protocols uh, at this time period, he would have held a symbolic funeral for his son being dead to him. But that isn't how Jesus saw him. That isn't how Jesus saw even, even the oldest son, right? Remember last week he talked about, son, everything that I have is yours. Jesus is not just doing this for the prodigals. He does it for the Pharisees and the scribes. The same gifts that are available to the prodigal are available to the legalistic, uh, prideful people. And he wants nothing more than that relationship. This is a story about God and his relationship to us. Through all the chaos and the hurt, there is Jesus trying to restore and repair his relationship to us. Going back to where the text tells us that he saw the son from a long way off, there, there, it says he was standing on the porch waiting. He's, he was him from a long ways off, which means that this has now become part of the father's everyday routine. Every day he is watching and waiting and hoping. They, the love that he has for his son is so great that he can't help himself. And when he sees him, the word for talking about he was filled with compassion, it's actually the words, it's, it's talking about how the fact that he was so filled with compassion, the compassion moved in him somewhat, his belly hurt. And more accurately, his bowels ached because he was so happy to see his son. Think about the level of joy that you have to have in order for your bowels so deep in your gut that you can't even explain it. It's just there because you're so filled with love for somebody. That is how Jesus is with us, is his guts hurt when he loves us so much. Will you stand with me? The first part of Luke 15 is Jesus telling stories uh, about the fact that there are parties taking place in heaven when one sinner comes to repentance. He tells the story of the, the lost coin and the lost sheep. And here's the thing about the lost coins. They didn't lose themselves on purpose, right? They didn't, they didn't lose, you know, they, 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 somebody had misplaced them. They didn't do it on purpose. And sheep, sheep were just dumb and wander off. And so these two, the coin and the sheep, they had no choice in it, right? They weren't making conscious decisions to leave. But the prodigal son, he made the choice to leave. He made the choice to reject his father. He made a choice to turn his back on his family. And that is so it shows us all that. And then yet still, even with the sheep and the coin, not their fault, prodigal son, your fault, there is still a party that takes place because that is how much Jesus loves you and is so excited to have a, a relationship with you and to restore you as his children. The two sons are completely shunning their father, their family, and their heritage. They were different in their approaches, but both had rejected their dad, and they were intentional about their sin. Worship team, if you'll begin to play. But our heavenly father, he doesn't see our past mistakes. He doesn't see our mess-ups. He doesn't see our blatant disregard for him. He sees us in those things. He is aware of your sin. He is aware of your problems. He is aware of your past mistakes. He's not like he's like, oh, I didn't know about that. Oh, if I'd have known that, I might have changed my mind here. No, no, he is well aware of those things, but he just sees past them to see you. He sees us and loves us anyways. The Father's love is unconditional. This is the same Father who, Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Hear me. Listen, I don't care if you've been saved one week or 50 years. All of us need to hear this. Jesus loves you that much that he is willing to die for you while you're still a sinner. He doesn't wait for you to clean your act up. He doesn't wait for you to really show that you're sorry and repentful. He says, no, no, bring the best robe, bring the sandals, bring the ring. We're restoring this child of mine who was lost, but now is found. Let's throw a party because he's finally home. That is how much Jesus loves you. And we should never get tired of hearing about it, thinking about it, reading about it, rejoicing in it, because that is the single greatest gift you will ever receive. I've got some good gifts in my life. None of them compare to what Jesus gave me. Nothing, and it continues to give me, because it's not a one-time thing. He continually pours out his love for you, and he wants to be a part of your life. He wants you to take him to war with you. He doesn't want you to leave him on the sidelines. He doesn't want you to, all right, Jesus, I'm leaving for today. 
I'll see you when I get back. No, no, no. He wants to be with you every step of the way. He wants us to call out on him. He wants us to use him. And if we're not doing that on a daily basis, we are going into a battle ill-prepared and ill-equipped, and we will lose. You will lose. Listen, I don't, I don't like giving the devil too much credit, but I also think we don't give him enough credit at times. He's good at what he does. There's a reason why billions of people are lost and away from Jesus. We have got to make sure that our relationship with the Father is strong and it's good, it's healthy, because he will be a pro protector, he will be a provider, he will be generous in his blessings, and he will always be there to give us grace that we need. We're no longer a slave to anything. As children of the King, we have full access, we have full privileges, we have full rights. We should not be slaves to anything. And if one of us would act like children of the King, and walk in that privilege, and walk in that authority, and walk in that power, our lives would be changed dramatically. Happy Father's Day to all you fathers out there. I am proud to be amongst your ranks. Um, I hope you have a great day. I hope your wife gives you back rubs and foot massages. My wife decided to steal Father's Day by having her birthday on it this year, so I get to split Father's Day. And so um, have a great day. Do not leave here. We have a little gift for you at the back doors. Um, the best is yet to come for this church. I cannot wait to be a part of it. I hope you have an incredible rest of the day. Pastor Regina, will you close us out in prayer? Lord, we're so thankful for the ability and the, the, to come into your house and to worship you this morning. It's such a privilege to be a part of your kingdom. Lord, and I thank you, Lord, that today we've been reminded about your grace, about the fact that you are a protector of who we are and that you are gracious with us, Lord, in so many ways. And, Lord, we ask that as we each one go our way and we go to our work and we do what we ought to do this week, Lord, that your spirit and presence would be upon us, that would be reminding us that you are there for us every single day. And, Lord, we thank you for that. And we ask blessings over each and every family, each and every father in this place today. And in your holy, precious name, we say, amen. Be blessed today.